Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world, and so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. Loads and loads of love, as I said, and, and don't forget to go and get yourself that perfect drink, because I've got a lovely story for you tonight, and I hope you're keeping lovely and warm as the weather gets considerably colder. But for those of you that are in hotter parts of the world, I hope you're keeping lovely and cool. So before we get together to listen to a story, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, Paisley Catkins was my grandmother. She lived in a tiny, whimsical little white brick cottage in the middle of the woods in the bluegrass state of Kentucky. She was an independent, self-sufficient woman who had lived on her own most of her life as her husband died in his early thirties after contracting a bad bout of pneumonia. I had grown up in Houston in Texas and had little contact with my grandmother, so I knew very little about her as she never turned up for family Christmases or Thanksgivings but preferred to remain exactly where she was, favouring the solitude of the natural world than being with the family. Every year she would send me a beautiful knitted sweater, but I had never actually met her. When I was 14 years old, my mother suggested I go and stay with her for a while. My mother's a bit of a loner, she admitted to me, somewhat of a recluse, but I think it would be fabulous for you to become acquainted with her, as me and your father are going on a business trip together. This would be the perfect time for you to go and stay with her. But what if she doesn't want me there, I protested. I mean, she shunned every family invite for Christmas and Thanksgiving, so she clearly doesn't want family around. It's complicated, said my mother. I wouldn't say shunned. I'd say politely declined. It's the same thing, isn't it, I piped. My mother was chopping carrots on a wooden board in the kitchen for the casserole that she was preparing. She handed me some tomatoes to slice for the salad. My mother never stopped chopping for a moment, but she did look reflective. You know, your grandmother didn't have an easy life growing up as a young girl. She was the eldest of three children, very different to her two other sisters. She was creative, individualistic and imaginative. They were studious and academic. It seemed that her mother favoured the other two siblings over her oldest daughter, fussing over them all the time, buying them fabulous things, but just ignoring her oldest. She would come home having shopped with her two younger children, always leaving Paisley out, who would be left at home all on her own. They would return home to show my mother what they'd bought, but my mother never got a single thing. Can you imagine how that would make you feel, seeing your siblings spoilt rotten, but you get nothing? She said sometimes she felt as if she was watching her family through a glass pane, as if she didn't exist. She felt like a ghost in her own household. Just imagine that. That's disgusting, I said. So unfair. Blatant discrimination. What kind of a mother behaves like that? Of course it distressed my mother, because such favouritism meant she felt as if she wasn't good enough, and there was something wrong with her. But she grit her lip and got on with her life, accepting the status quo. When she got older, she asked her mother if she could borrow money to buy something smart for a job interview that she was applying for at a pharmacy. Her mother refused to even loan her the money. But when the youngest daughter asked for a dress the very same day for a barbecue the following weekend, of course the mother didn't flinch and brought her daughter that dress. Your grandmother never forgot the injustice of that. It was like a kick in the teeth to her. My mother said that it was the teachers at her school that would go on and on about her. What an exceptional young girl she was. So creative, so talented. But her mother failed to see it. Instead, her mother complained bitterly that the teachers weren't complimenting her two other children. Why did they keep going on about Paisley, when it was her other two children that were the stars, she would say begrudgingly. It sounds a bit like a Cinderella story. I hadn't thought about it like that. I believe my mother's childhood and the way her own family distanced themselves from her was the reason that she withdrew from people, which explains why she doesn't interact socially, prefers her own company. I get it now, I said. I mean, who'd want to hang around people who are looking down on you? It's so much better to be alone in that case. That's why, sweetheart, never judge someone else's actions, because sometimes their actions are born from a place of hurt. But are you sure my grandmother would want me around, if she's as reclusive as you say? Her grandchild? Heavens, yes! She'll be delighted to see you. 
She's a lovely lady. You will really, really like her. I was naturally excited to meet my grandmother, who'd been spoken about so warmly by my mother on multiple occasions, but I'd never had the privilege to meet her. As for her mysterious cottage in the woods, it had been a purchase of my grandmother's in more recent years. My mother had been absolutely appalled when she'd learnt the news. Why would you buy a house in the middle of the woods, she complained. It's not safe for an old woman like you to live on your own like this in a remote area. What if you have a nasty fall, or you get bitten by a snake? Who's going to help you? Regina, you do worry your head way too much. If I get bitten by a snake and succumb to its lethal venom, I'm okay with that. It means that that's the way the good Lord wants me to go. I'm not going to live a life tucked away in a suburban suburb. I want to be close to nature. If it means that I'm taking risks, then so be it. I'd rather live a fulfilling life than a safe one. Besides, I won't be living too far away from town. But, Mum... No buts, dear. This is my decision to make, not yours. I remember the day the taxi drove me to Grandma Paisley's home. The truck drove down the smooth ribbon of asphalt, taking a left-hand turn onto a dusty red road, where the rubber tyres lifted up the powdery dust in the air that was causing us to cough and splutter in the taxi. Then it took a swift right-hand turn onto a long, bumpy road that was filled with potholes and covered in rocks, where it wobbled precariously, jolting up and down. There was a wide opening in some trees where the truck finally entered, and there, bang in the middle of this wooded sanctuary, surrounded by clusters of red maples, service berries and oak trees, was the prettiest house that I've ever seen. It would seem the light from the forest canopy twinkled and sparkled through the trees, dancing over the contours of the house in pretty ethereal shafts of light. It was like the whole house glistened and gleamed. It was a very cute house with a stone facade and brick walls all painted in white. The ornate, stylish front door was an electric blue colour. It was so bewitching and charmed, something that wouldn't have looked out of place in a Hans Andersen fairy tale. "'Nice place you've got here!' said the taxi driver. This dreamy cottage is pure poetry. But that bloody road to get here is one hell of a liability. I'm dreading the drive back. Are you going to be all right? Do you want to check if someone's in or not? No, I'll be fine, I assured the taxi driver, thanking him, while he removed my suitcase from the trunk. I watched him driving away. His truck groaned, heaved, jolted and wobbled down that obstacle course of a road until he was nothing but a dot in the distance. I walked to the front door and tapped it gently. It creaked wide open. Anyone there, I called, but there was no answer. I entered the unpretentious cottage, was greeted to a cheerful, cosy, mellow interior designed for comfort in every regard. It was simplistic, homely, but stylish, with soft, cushy white leather couches, bright, colourful scatter cushions in warm, rich reds, golds, oranges and burgundies. There were fluffy white rugs strewn generously over the gleaming, polished oakwood floors, the perfect place to nestle cold feet on bitter, chilly winter nights. There were fireplaces with marble mantles in virtually every room, including the living area. The main living area boasted floor-to-ceiling bookshelves, bursting at the seams with interesting, fascinating-looking books, while the butter-coloured walls were covered in sumptuous tapestries, enchanting pictures of woodland scenes, and profusive, ornate-looking mirrors, while the sash windows looked out onto spectacular views of the statuesque emerald green forest. The glass sliding doors in the living room opened out into a well-appointed wraparound porch that was comfortably decked out with swanky upholstered chairs and a prodigal round oakwood dinner table. It rarely overlooked the most stunning stream with a natural waterfall where the exuberant fountains of fast-moving opaque water with creaming white froth crashed down the rocky cliff face to the pools of water below. Hello, dear, came a soft voice. I turned around to see my grandmother, who was smiling at me, a warm, bright, sunny smile. She dashed over to me lovingly, enveloping me in her arms with a generous, warm hug. "'Let's have a look at you,' she said, stepping back. "'Let me see. Yes, you do rather remind me of your mother when you were her age. The same petite bone structure, the long, dark black hair, the pretty blue eyes. But you're also strikingly different in another way.' "'Maybe it's your energy, I'm not sure,' she said indecisively. "'I can't quite fathom what it is, but never you mind. I'll soon work it out.' 
My grandmother was a woman in her eighties, although I never did find out her exact age. I knew better than to ask such an indiscreet question. She was a petite woman of over four foot tall, with a full head of white, buoyant, curly hair, and the brightest blue eyes I've ever seen, that sparkled with a lively, animated energy. Her paper-thin, delicate skin was well creased, with many crinkled expression lines around the contours of her wizened eyes. There were time-worn furrows on her forehead. She was dressed in a stylish pair of contemporary white cotton pants, with a sophisticated soft pink cashmere cardigan, with a vertical line of elegant pearl buttons that was complemented by a chic string of pearls that she wore around her neck, while her tiny little feet were decked out in an ultra-modern pair of white pumps. She looked tastefully dressed, elegant but casual. So, what do you think of my quaint, rather twee fairy tale cottage, tucked away in the heart of the woods? Isn't it so idyllic? I think it's beautiful. I agreed, but living out here on your own, surely you get lonely. Not really, dear. When you get to my age, you crave peace and quiet. You cherish tranquillity. I love nothing better than being close to the trees and the water. It energizes my spirit. I do make regular trips into town to stock up on supplies. I visit the church every Sunday, so no, I'm not lonely. No, I'm never lonely. That evening, my grandmother and I sat around a cosy, crackling fire in the living room, watching the flames crackle and spit. It felt as if we'd known each other all our lives. She was so easy to be around, informal, uncomplicated, warm-hearted, benevolent—the kind of person that is energizing and uplifting, rather than draining and exhausting. I felt serene, complacent, placid around her, as I did with the trees in my yard at home and around my cat Molly, who was always unconditionally loving. Perhaps it was also that she had no expectations in me, but accepted me as I was, while my parents were always looking for ways that I could improve myself. It was fall, and so there was a bracing chill in the air, and the crackling fire enveloped us in a cosy warmth. That was when I asked my grandmother if there was any time that she had been afraid living out here in the woods, and then she told me her remarkable story. My grandmother took a neat sip of her sherry, paused for a moment, wringing her fingers together. "Are you sure you want to hear this?" "Absolutely certain," I said. All my life, I fantasized about living in the woods. For some reason, I've always been drawn to the trees, so I was on the lookout for acquiring a property that fit the bill. I contacted a number of estate agents to let them know exactly what I was looking for. I said I wanted a little white brick and stone, quaint little cottage situated in the middle of the woods, overlooking the water. And you know what they said to me? I shrugged my shoulders. No. What did they say? I'm sorry, ma'am, but it's most improbable that you will find anything exactly like that. So you might consider compromising, settling for a wooden cabin, perhaps. I said absolutely not. It must be a small white cottage built from brick and stone. Of course, they went through the motions of humouring me. They said they'd be in touch if they found anything that fit the description, but I could tell by the bland, uninspiring, lifeless tones in their voices that they had me down as a finickety, fussy, cantankerous customer that wasn't easily satisfied and would be very difficult to please. Weeks passed, and I never heard so much as a dicky bird from the estate agents. So I phoned them up again, asking them whether they had any luck in finding my white cottage. One of the estate agents, a delightful young lady called Victoria Pierce, said, "How do you know about the white cottage? It's only come on the market today. When did you say you'd like to see it?" I made an appointment with the woman to see the cottage. The moment my truck drove down this driveway, gliding through the trees. I gasped in astonishment when I saw this whimsical, quaint, quirky white cottage. I was transfixed to see that it mirrored the idiosyncratic cottage I'd been dreaming about years before. It was as if the perfect picture of my dreams had morphed into our reality. I mean, how was that even possible? I was flabbergasted and confounded. You mean the cottage was exactly the same as the one you had been hoping to acquire, the one you'd visualized owning in your mind's eye? Exactly the same, right down to the tiny details of the blue front door. I remember I just stood there gawking, staring at the cottage as if I'd seen a ghost. The estate agent got out of her truck. She walked over to me. I was so bedazzled and enamored by the cottage, I barely noticed her standing there. "Are you all right, madam?" she asked me. "You look as white as a sheet. Can I get you a glass of water?" Naturally, I assured her I'd be fine. 
but after a quick look around the cottage, I told her I would take the place at its asking price. I wasn't about to negotiate for something I wanted. Negotiation always comes with a risk. I wasn't about to take a risk. I knew I must have the cottage. That was when the estate agent revealed the bad news to me. She told me that the eccentric old lady that lived at the cottage was not willing to sell the house to anyone. She would need to interview the buyer first before she gave the all clear for the sale to go ahead. As you can imagine, I was gobsmacked by this outlandish expectation. The agent said to me, I'll be completely straight with you. Three years ago, this capricious old lady put her cottage on the market. Dozens of people put in offers for the unorthodox little place. The old lady insisted on interviewing all of them before she agreed to sell, and none of the potential buyers met with her approval. I'm telling you this, she told me, as I don't really fancy your chances in acquiring the cottage, given what happened last time. The woman is very strange. Naturally, I knew I had nothing to lose. I mean, this cottage existed in my dreams. Surely it was meant for me. It was arranged that I would meet the lady of the cottage for afternoon tea that day. "'I want to tell you, my dear,' said my grandmother, squeezing my arm tightly. "'I was so terrified. "'I've been nervous before in my life, on many occasions, "'for interviews, exams, important occasions, but not like this, never like this. "'I was trembling as I arrived at the cottage doors, my knees buckling beneath me, "'while in the back of my throat I had this huge lump. "'The old woman gestured me into the house. "'She was a slight woman, not too different from me now that I am her age, actually.' She wore very funky spectacles, shaped into butterfly wings in bright pink, and she wore bright pink lipstick and pink clothing. She looked at me intently and gestured for me to sit down on her pink ottoman, and then she asked me why I wanted to buy her cottage. I said, I've seen it in my dreams. It's calling my name. She said to me, it's possibly because it is. I think we can safely say I found the buyer for my home. Congratulations. And that was it, I asked. That was it. I think the estate agent virtually had a heart attack when the old lady agreed to sell me the cottage. So I moved into the property forthwith, and for the first time in my life I felt like I belonged, a little like an old slipper going missing and being reunited with its other half. It was as if I'd always belonged here. One night after I retired to bed, I suddenly heard a banging sound, as if someone was pounding the house, as the vibrations seemed to roll across the wooden floor causing the furniture to rattle, and even my own bed began to wobble unsteadily. Then the front door was thrust violently off its hinges, and gusts of icy cold air came rushing through the house. I sat up in bed thinking, what the heck is going on? I remember my heart was thundering violently in my chest, my guts felt as if they'd been ripped out of my body. I began to panic. In seconds, two young men both barged into my bedroom. Their heads were covered in stockings. On the stockings they were wearing headlamps. They were pointing rifles at me, demanding me to show them where the money was. Woman, take us to your stash of cash, they yelled. Now! I felt I'd woken up in the middle of a horror movie. It seemed all so surreal to me. I'd been half asleep, so to wake up with these two men yelling at me and pointing rifles in my face was bizarre to say the least. I trembled as I climbed out of bed in my white nightgown, while the rifle was thrust violently in my back. I delicately scampered into the kitchen and pointed to the biscuit tin. The money's in there, I said. They pulled out a few dollar notes and scattered them on the floor, screaming, Is this a bloody joke, woman? We're not easily fooled. We didn't come here for pittance. Tell us where the rest of the loot is. We have it on good authority that you keep a sleeping bag stashed with lots of cash in this house. Thousands and thousands of dollars, we believe. You're scared of banks, aren't you? We want that money now. We know you've got it. I don't keep cash in the house. I trembled. But look around. You can take anything you want. But please, please don't hurt me. Don't lie, woman. Word around town is that you do have thousands of dollars in a sleeping bag. Don't pull the wool over our eyes. Well, maybe the previous owner did, but not me. I've only recently moved into this cottage. You must have your wires crossed. It's not me that's got thousands of dollars stashed away at home. They started to hit me with the back of their rifles. Where's the loot? 
They screamed, if you don't tell us, we will kill you. I knew that this was not going to end well, as these men were volatile and unhinged. I started to think quickly on my feet. I told them I'd hidden the cash in the tool shed. Why I said that, I can't really fathom. Maybe it was to stop them hitting me so hard, as they were really hurting me. My body was throbbing and aching with pain, and I was crying. My plan was to escape and hide somewhere in the woodgrove under the cover of darkness, where that would be my greatest opportunity to escape these brutal men. They marched me by the back of my shoulders to the tool shed. It wasn't too dark, as the moon was full and the stars plentiful, so visibility was excellent. They thundered around the tool shed, rooting through everything. Where is the loot, woman? They screamed. Show us now. I acted vague, indeterminate, confused. I pretended my memory was foggy, which made them exceedingly mad with me. I, I don't remember. I, I do remember I put it somewhere here, but I can't remember. It, it's somewhere around here. They kept hurling insults at me. They began to tear the tool shed apart, looking in tins, old baskets, boxes, you name it, thrusting them out of the shed into the yard, where they littered everything with chaos and old paint cans, yard tools and camping equipment literally peppered the ground. They were kicking things with their feet violently, ripping everything up in sight. Regretfully, I didn't have a chance to escape, as one of the men kept his steely eyes pinned on me. I was scared of them, not getting what they were looking for, as I could see they were becoming murderous in their rage. Their anger was escalating every passing second. Don't get any funny ideas, woman. If you so much as try to escape, it's a bullet in the head for you. Why are you doing this to me, I trembled. Get over yourself, woman. It's nothing personal. We need the money. I promise you I knew those men wouldn't hesitate to shoot me. I was only glad they were wearing stockings on their head, as it meant that there was a possibility I could come out of this alive, as they were covering their identities, which could mean that they weren't intending to murder me. They wanted to make sure that I couldn't identify them. All of a sudden you could hear this thumping, crashing noise coming from the trees. The only way I can describe it was it sounded as if a huge train was hurtling through the woods towards us. I could hear tree limbs shaking, leaves rustling, branches breaking and cracking. The two men looked startled. They looked around themselves nervously. What the heck is that? they said. While the men were slightly distracted by the noise, I attempted to run away. But one of the men grabbed me by the collar of my nightgown so that I fell onto the ground. He stared at me with enraged eyes. No, you don't, he shrieked. There's no money, is there? he said, growling. You're leading us up the garden path, aren't you? There's no bloody money. I nodded. I'm sorry. I told you I don't keep money in the house. It's too late for sorries. He was about to kick me with his heavy combat boots. Then suddenly a dark silhouette came thundering towards us like a great big dense giant blob of black. The men both screamed, Bloody hell! What the heck? This dark humanoid being shaped like a giant covered in hair grabbed one of the men, hurling him up in the air like a Catherine wheel. The other man, on seeing what was happening to his friend, literally let out a shrill scream and began to run as fast as he could, not even waiting for his friend, as his only interest was in saving his own skin. He couldn't get away fast enough. While the bizarre creature continued to whirl the terrifying man in the air a couple more times, catching him in mid-flight like a frisbee, then finally he put him on the ground. The man, now safely on terra firma, began to hightail it as fast as he could away from the cottage. He began screaming, It's a Bigfoot! It's a Bigfoot! Bloody hell! It's a goddamn Bigfoot! Get out of here! It's going to kill us! The creature began mock chasing him, releasing these ear piercing screams, throwing rocks after the men. Once the men had gone, I was so stunned, confounded, and completely flabbergasted. I didn't know what to think because whatever this creature was, he'd saved my life. I was shaking so much and trembling. The creature led me to a tree and got me to sit down against the tree trunk for support. The one thing I knew with absolute certainty was that those men would never be coming back, and they never did. But I didn't know who they were, or why there was a rumour in town that I kept a stash of money, thousands of dollars in a sleeping bag. What? I gasped. The creature that saved your life? It was a Bigfoot. 
Now, I know that to be the case. Back then, I wasn't sure what it was. Yes, it was a Bigfoot. What did it look like, I asked. Well, this Bigfoot was about eight foot tall with long flowing dark hair and a conical shaped head. Truly, it looked like a giant human being covered with hair. Wow, I said. Did you ever see it again? It has a name, my grandmother told me. I call him Shadow. Are you saying that he's still around, I asked. If he is, will I meet him? Oh, I'm not sure about that, said my grandmother, looking at me honestly. Shadow knows you're here, as his kind know everything that's going on. They're very sensitive to changes in the environment. They know when a stranger's around, and when they do, they keep their distance. You see, when I moved into this cottage, the creatures got used to me, as they possibly did the old lady before me. I would hasten to say that I'm sure they had some kind of interaction with her, something she was not inclined to share with me, and rightly so. There are three Bigfoot living here. Shadow, his female partner, and a little youngling. Well, they're not like regular humans. They're exceedingly ambiguous, evasive, enigmatic, and elusive. In truth, I've only ever had fleeting glances of his female partner. She's so bashful, shy, and self-effacing. She often shrinks into the shadows behind the tree watching me. Her youngling is equally as reticent and demure, but inquisitively curious nevertheless. Shadow is quite comfortable, complacent, and at ease in my presence— has often joined me when I've gone foraging for mushrooms and berries, and has helped me gather stuff. He often leaves me some rainbow trout on my front door, as he knows I love fish. He keeps a watch over the cottage all the time. I believe he sees the cottage, me and these woods, as his territory. So you mark my words, I'm safe here, as those creatures have my back. But as for you getting a glimpse of one of these creatures, I think it's highly unlikely." I was enjoying spending time with my grandmother and learning all about her life. I wanted to understand why she enjoyed solitude rather than interacting with people, as I was to understand that she didn't have many friends, but it seemed these guardians of the forest had become her unlikely companions. I awoke up one night to hear some whistling. The whistling was intent. It demanded my attention. I sat up and crept over to the window sill. I could hear my grandmother open the front door. I looked out of the window. Luckily the moon was bright that night, so I could see Grandma Paisley standing next to this tall black creature that I realised must be Shadow. I could feel my heart thumping excitedly in my chest, for the hope of seeing Shadow had dimmed after my grandmother had told me it would be improbable that I would ever get to meet him. Yet I could see him clearly, larger than life, but my attention was focused on his leathery human-like face and the jubilant expression that he was wearing. Shadow appeared to be jumping up and down on his huge legs like an excitable dog, chattering away in a foreign language that I've never heard before, speaking incredibly fast. He kept pointing towards the woods. My grandmother slipped back into the house, grabbed her dressing gown, while she wrapped it around her frail form. She placed her head torch on her head, and she walked hurriedly after the creature. I wasted no time at all in throwing on my jeans and a sweatshirt and a pair of sneakers and dashing down the stairs out of the front door, where I was greeted by gusty, icy cold air. I chose to keep a safe distance behind my grandmother and Shadow trying best not to be seen by them. The wind whistled through the trees while fallen leaves floated in the wind like celestial butterflies. The boughs of the oak and maple trees seemed to move gently in the wind, as if they were dancing, while the crisp autumn leaves covered the forest floor in golden leaves. Even though there were no sounds from crickets or frogs, the woodgrove felt peaceful and tranquil. I crunched the leaves beneath my feet with every step. I had to be very cautious about being as discreet as I possibly could. I followed the duo into the woods, hiding behind trees at every given opportunity. It was then that I saw the female Bigfoot with her youngling at her side in a clearing in the woods. I stopped dead in my tracks, hardly daring to believe what I was observing. She was in the throes of giving birth. I could hardly believe it. She was squatting on the ground on her haunches, sweating, grunting and groaning as she started to push. She seemed surprised to see my grandmother on the scene, watching her, but I think the pain had abolished her fear. She almost welcomed the presence of another female. My grandmother moved cautiously towards the creature. The light of her headlamp enabled me to see it clearly. My grandmother reached for the creature's hand and squeezed it firmly in hers. It got lost in her big sausage-like fingers of the female, dwarfing my grandmother so much that she looked like a tiny doll next to the creature. 
Her bright brown eyes looked illuminated with excited anticipation and gratitude, as well as pain all rolled into one. Go on, you can do it, my grandmother urged. Push, push, come on, you can do it, push, she kept saying. Her gentle words were encouraging, kind, reassuring. Shadow was in the corner watching the scene unfold, continuously jumping up and down on his legs. He was so excited. I've never seen anyone look that jubilant before. He looked like a proud father to be, as his bright, deep-set, dark eyes set in his leathery face looked so enthused, while the youngling, a four-foot-tall, lanky, thin male, appeared to be behaving exactly like his father. There was an exuberant electric buzz in the air. I realised my grandmother's calm energy must have been very stabilising and soothing in this fired-up atmosphere, when some calm energy was gladly appreciated by the poor female. Finally, with one last anguished cry, a baby emerged from her womb, a grey-coloured creature with a fine scattering of black hair. There were rapturous whoops from the father and son, while the female creature severed the umbilical cord with a sharp stone. Then she gathered her baby in her arms, cradling her to her chest, her brown eyes filled with a mother's joy and pride. She patted the baby's back, and it let out a strange cry. My grandmother was saying, "'Well done, girl! You did it! You did it!' She rubbed her hands on the creature's forehead to wipe away the sweat with her hands. "'You did it, girl! Well done! You did it!' The Bigfoot mother looked absolutely thrilled. Her brown eyes sparkled with joy. She handed the baby over to my grandmother. Grandmother Paisley cuddled the baby in her arms. Tears were pouring down her face. It's a girl! It's so beautiful! So beautiful! I was so in awe of this magical arresting scene that I moved away from the trees towards the Bigfoot and her baby. I wanted to hold the beautiful baby like my grandmother had done. For a second the Bigfoots were surprised by my presence, but nothing could dampen their enthusiasm. They graciously welcomed me into their circle of celebration. The mother handed me her baby to hold. I cuddled it closely in my arms. It looked upon me with the most intelligent, shining, warm eyes, and my heart melted like butter. After this incredible, awesome event, my grandmother was so moved that the Bigfoots had chosen to include us, well, rarely her, in the celebration of the birth of their baby. In the days that followed, the female creature would bring her baby girl to us so that we could cuddle the little thing. The act of giving birth had banished the female's former reticence. In the years that followed, my grandmother's relationship with the Bigfoot family grew very strong. My grandmother died twenty years ago, but this poignant memory of watching a mother Bigfoot give birth will forever stay with me, as it was one of the most moving experiences of my entire life. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night. <laughs> <laughs>